children may be dismissed to children's church at this time. For the rest of us, let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. We have been learning about God's kingdom. In Genesis 11, we've learned that uh, God created the earth to establish his kingdom on earth. We learned that his kingdom, uh, we learned about who the God of the kingdom is, who the people of the kingdom are, and we learned about the rule of God's kingdom. We learned quickly, though, that there is an alternative kingdom to God's kingdom, and that this serpent seeks to usurp God's people by causing us to doubt God's goodness and his greatness. This is called sin. We've learned about how the anatomy of sin, how it grows, and yet we've also seen the hope that we have if we're in the kingdom of God. So today we're going to be learning about God's kingdom from Genesis 11 in particular. We're going to be learning about what life in the serpent's kingdom looks like. Now many of you have probably seen Aladdin. Uh, there's been a few Aladdins at this point. But the thing about Aladdin is you have this boy who finds a lamp, a magical lamp. And in this lamp is a genie. Now, genie is the most powerful entity or being in the universe, right? According to this worldview. And yet, genie is a slave. You have this big blue genie who could do anything, but he's a slave. You can think of also of a jukebox. I don't know if you guys remember jukeboxes. Uh, but a jukebox or just any computer. A computer is powerful, right? A computer could do anything. And yet a computer is a slave to those who are inputting the keys into the computer for it. You see, it's easy to think of God. It's easy to think God's like the big blue genie from Aladdin. It's easy to think that God's like a computer, the most powerful entity in the world, and yet controlled by us. That is a deadly worldview, and that's the worldview we see on display in Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 11, you have a people who think that they can control God. You have a people who think that they can use God to get what they want. But brothers and sisters, what we see in Genesis 11 is that that is not our God. You cannot control God. You cannot manipulate God. You cannot gain God to be your personal genie. So as Moses is, is uh, describing to us life in the serpent's kingdom and showing us that sin morphs and grows to a desire to control God, we learn several emphases. The first thing we learn in this uh, chapter is we learn about sinful humanity. We learn in verses 1 through 4 that humanity is very industrious. That humanity is capable of achieving great things. And yet, humanity is at the core sinful. So let's read God's perfect and inspired word for us. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. The perfect word of our God says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the entire earth. The first thing we're learning about humanity is that humans are industrious. Notice what the humans are doing in Genesis chapter 11. They're building bricks according, according to verse 3. Now the process of baking bricks is, 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 an advance, is, an, is, uh, is advanced. First you have to be able to identify the right kind of soil. Not just any soil will make, uh, will make bricks. The soil in Upland ain't making bricks. The soil in Beaumont, where I live, that's going to make bricks. You need clay soil. And then you need to ground the soil very, very fine. And then you add water. 
and then you heat it up. And when you heat up this finely ground clay soil with the addition of water, you get bricks. Now, the people in Genesis 11 aren't just a little industrious. They're super industrious because look what they're doing in verse 3. They are not only making bricks, they are burning them thoroughly. You see, the hotter you can burn this clay soil, the stronger the brick is going to be. Moses is going at great lengths to be able to describe humanity has ingenuity and industry. We're capable of great things. Notice also that they have what's called bitumen, which is also tar. Now, the thing about tar, which is often used on roofs, is that it's waterproof. You see, in the ancient world, if you didn't waterproof your structure, it would erode. And shortly after constructing it, it would be gone. But what these people in Genesis 11 are doing is they're building bricks, very, very strong bricks. And they're adding tar in order to make a building that is strong and one that will last. Now notice what he says in verse 3. Moses says that they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Now when you burn a brick... Super, super hot. It becomes as strong as stone. And mortar isn't, uh, isn't waterproof. So again, Moses is saying that here you have humans who can take soil and make it as strong as stones. And these people are settling in a place called Shinar, which is southern Mesopotamia. And there is, there is no stones out there. So here what we have going on is Moses is showing us, here we have a people who are able to take and make something very strong, a tall, tall, tall tower in a place where they have no stones. What's being said here is humanity is industrious. Humans are smart. Humans are intelligent. Humans can accomplish a lot. But then in verse 4, we learn that the people of Babel aren't using their industry and ingenuity to accomplish God's plan. Rather, they're using their ingenuity and their industry to accomplish a satanic plan. In verse 4, Moses tells us that the people say, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the entire planet. Now, what was humans' mission? It was to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth for the glory of God. The plan for humanity is to spread God's glory over the entire planet. But what are the people in Babel doing? They're using their industry to make a name for themselves. They're using their ingenuity to build their own glory, not the glory of God. And this is what life in the serpent's kingdom is all about. Life in God's kingdom is living for his glory, even when it's tough, even when there's trials, even when there's temptations. Life in the serpent's kingdom is using your gifts, the gifts God has given you, to glorify him and to be enjoyed by you. Life in the serpent's kingdom, you're using those gifts and twisting them. Not so that they glorify God, but so that they glorify ourselves. Now that's so easy to do. It is so easy to, get, to take the resources God is giving us and use them for ourselves because we all too often have a very high view of ourselves and a very low view of God. It's easy to live for yourself. It's easy for me to live for myself when I think God is really, really small and I think I'm really, really great. And that's exactly what the people in Babel are doing. They have a low view of God. They have a high view of man. This is clear when we investigate what are they building. The text says they're building a tower that has its tops in the heavens. Now, we know about this building from other ancient Near Eastern sources. 
And what we learn about this building is that its purpose was to be a staircase to the divine. The people in Babel are building a staircase in order to give them access to the gods. But not only that, they're building a staircase to give the gods access to them. And when we look at this tower in the ancient Near East, what they would do is they would construct a wooden structure on the top of this mountain. And they, the priests would put refreshments on the top of this tall building. Why? Because when the god comes down to earth, he needs refreshment. So he takes of the food and he eats and is refreshed. And as he goes down uh, the, uh, the tower, there's other places for more refreshment. Now, a important part of the calendar of the ancient world was the new year, just like for us. We like to celebrate the new year. Well, the way these people would celebrate the new year is that the king would go onto the top of the tower with a priestess and they would, they would have relations together and that fertility would symbolize and seek to manipulate the gods to give a fertile crop in the upcoming year. So when we look at what these people are building, a staircase to gain access to God, a staircase to give God access to you, we see that this is a very low view of God and a very high view of man. The thought that you can build a staircase and thus ensure divine blessings is nothing less than thinking that God is the big blue genie from Aladdin. That he is no different than your MacBook Pro computer. He has all the power in the world and you can harness that power for your good. That's what the people of Babel are doing. Building a staircase, giving access to the divine realm and the human realm. Why is this a low view of God? First of all, the thought that God needs a staircase. Isn't that a low view of God? God doesn't need a staircase. The fact that God needs refreshment. What a low view of God. Does God need to eat food? No. Is God encouraged to bring a fertile orange harvest by watching people have sexual relations? Absolutely not. This is a low view of God. This is a perverted view of God. And what a high view of man. The thought that, oh, us Babylonians, we could just bring our ingenuity together and build a tall, tall tower. And we could therefore have access to God. What a high view of man. That if you just work hard enough, you can guarantee God's blessings in your life. What a high view of man. Again, in that worldview, God is just the big blue genie, a slave to you. So what we see happening in Babel is we have people who are made in the image of God, who are capable of great things. And they are doing great things. They're in the desert. And they have the ability to build a big, big tower. They have the ability to take soil and to make it like stone. They have the ability to discover waterproof caulking. This is great. And yet, they and us, we use our resources to make a name for ourselves. We don't use our resources to make a name for God. And that's easy to do because we, like them, often have a very high view of man and a very low view of God. Now, that's a sneaky worldview. It happens when somebody thinks, well, I can just sin and God will forgive me because it's his job. You've heard that happen, right? And sometimes you've embodied that where you think, oh, I can... Just smoke weed one more time and God will forgive me. It's his job. That's what he does. That is exactly what the Babylonians are doing. What a low view of God. It's not God's job to forgive you. It's his grace to forgive you. 
So for you to think, oh, God will just forgive me, it's his job, you're manipulating God. You think you could just harness God and guarantee divine blessings, namely forgiveness, by simply saying, God, will you forgive me? That is cheap. That is a cheap trick. And cheap tricks do not guarantee God's blessings. This worldview shows itself up in other ways, too. Perhaps you're thinking, oh, I'm really being obedient to God, so he'll give me a good life. Oh, I'm praying. I'm reading. I'm going to church. God's going to give me a good life. And then when sufferings come, you say, forget this. Forget God. I don't want him anyway. That, again, is a cheap trick. The thought that your efforts and my efforts can guarantee for ourselves divine blessings. What a low view of God. And what a high view of man. Or perhaps you think, oh, I'm being very loving to my spouse now. This will guarantee that they're loving back to me. God, I'm really being patient with my spouse right now. God, let them be patient. And weeks happen and weeks happen and they're not changing, but you're changing. And finally you just say, forget it, God. I'm done with loving my spouse because they haven't changed. Cheap trick. That's a cheap trick. Your effort, you cannot just work hard and guarantee for yourself divine blessings. That's not how this operates. That is a low view of God. And that, my friends, is a high view of man. So we see in these first four verses an industrious people who are using their industry for their own glory. We see them using cheap, cheap tricks in order to manipulate the divine. But then we see in verses 5 through 8 something amazing. An answer to this worldview. We see a picture of God. We're just like we've been learning in the Bible. When we see the awfulness of our sin, its main purpose is to highlight the amazing character of our God. And that's what we see happening in verses 5 through 8. Here we see a picture of a sovereign God. We see a picture of a just God. And very unexpected, we see a picture of a gracious God. So let's read. To the glory of God and for our joy, verses 5 through 8. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will not now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their languages so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Here we see a picture of our sovereign God. First, notice the humor. I love this. God is funny. Did you know that? He's funny. And we see his, his humor right here. Notice what verse 5 says. And the Lord came down. <laughs> the Lord came down. That's so funny. Because of this reason. That tower was supposed to be a staircase. God doesn't need a staircase. But now God says, well, let me come down there and see what's happening. Let me try this staircase on for size. Let me take it for a test run. How funny, right? Are you seeing why this is funny? God doesn't need it. He doesn't need a staircase. But he says, okay, you think you're building me a staircase? Well, let's just go down and try it out. How funny. So we see God's humor. Well, I'll come down and I'll show you what, what's up. But we see his sovereignty most of all. We see his sovereignty in verse 5 in that he comes down. He sees and he discusses and he makes a decision. That's what he does. Notice how there is no fight between God and man. God sees it. God decides and God does it. Humanity can't stop this. And what a comfort. What an absolute comfort. Ultimately, 
your sin will not stop God from accomplishing his purposes. Your sin, just like the Babylonians, they're in sin right now. But their sin is not going to stop God from accomplishing his purpose. He is sovereign. He does what he was always intending them to do. He disperses them so that they cannot make a name for themselves. What a comfort. God is sovereign even over your sin. What a comfort. So we see that God, in, in humor, comes down and expresses his sovereignty. And as we see this, we see that humanity, although we might rebel against God, we can never dethrone God. Although we are capable of much, we can never de-arm God. What a comfort. So we learn that God judges these people. He is a sovereign and just God. We also see that he is a very gracious God. We see this, first of all, in the judgment. Now, that may seem kind of strange. God is gracious in judgment, but he is. These people have sold their lives to the serpent's kingdom. They have sold their lives to make a name for themselves. That is not good for them. It is not a joyful task for them. And God doesn't allow it to continue. He says, I am not going to give you up to your sin. What an act of grace. God could have. He could have said, okay, Babylonians, I'm just going to give you over to a life of making much of yourself. What an awful thing that would have been. It is a gracious act of God to judge them. But the humor continues. So we saw the humor in God coming down as if God doesn't need to come down. But also, something that's not very clear in this text is that the words for uh, the people to build bricks and for God to confuse the languages are very, very similar. It's intentional. So here you have, on the one hand, these people building bricks, and God says, well, I'm going to confuse your language. Very, very similar sounding words. But also notice what is very clear in our English Bibles. Notice in verse 7, come, let us. Notice what the people are saying in verse 3, come, let us. And then in verse 4, come, let us. You have Moses structuring what the people are saying and structuring what God is saying, parallel to one another, to do two things. To show the evilness of sin, but to show the sovereign justice and graciousness of our God. That's the point. It's just highlights. God is sovereign. God is gracious. But notice how Genesis 11 ends. Genesis 11 ends with another genealogy. And what a gracious thing of God. You know, as we've been reading the Bible, we have come across some awful stories. But it's so kind of God that God almost immediately gives a glimmer of hope. He didn't have to do that. We could have been reading the Old Testament and all we saw was awful, 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 awful. We could have done that. And what a hopeless place we would have been in. To think that God is a just God to judge us. But as far as him showing us mercy, we have no idea. That could have been what God did. But he doesn't. As we've been seeing and reading and as I've been preaching about these awful stories, God shows us grace. Remember Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin. Genesis 3.15, a son will reverse the curse. Genesis 4, Lamech murder, sorry, Cain murders, and Lamech commits polygamy and child abuse, and then you have Seth. You have the flood account. People are wicked and evil always, and then you have Noah finding grace. And here we have Babel, the epitome of sin, a high view of man and a low view of God, and yet we have a genealogy of Shem. Remember, when Noah, after the flood, he had lots of good things to say about Shem. The line of redemption goes through Shem. 
And here we have his genealogy. So let's read to the glory of God. Chapter 11, verse 27. Let's read all the way down to verse 32. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ischah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. What another display of God's grace. The line of redemption continues. So what we have happening is Moses says, yes, your sin and the Babylonian sin is awful, but let those be lenses that point you to Shem's line. Because that's where we get Abram. And for the next two months, all the way up until April 12th on Easter, we are going to learn about Abram. We're going to go from Genesis 12 to Genesis 22, and we're going to see that there is a pathway to divine blessings. And it doesn't come from you or me ascending to heaven on our own ingenuity, but divine blessings come when God descends to earth. And that's through Abraham. So we're going to learn about something amazing, about how God's kingdom crashes into this earth through Abram. We're going to see a king who's unlike the kings of this world, and we're going to see a paradigm of salvation that's based on faith and not based on works. Get ready, brothers and sisters. For the next two months, we're going to see some amazing things about God's kingdom. But Moses leaves us with something tragic. Sarai is barren. Now, any time a woman has difficulties getting pregnant is an absolute tragedy. We were made to procreate and spread God's glory. We were made to enjoy the privilege of children. Children are a blessing. And when we have children, in a sense, we're participating in an act, the act of Mary a redemptive act, who bore Jesus. Being barren is an awful thing, a tragic thing. But for Sarai to be barren isn't just a personal tragedy. It is a universal tragedy. Through Eve, through Seth, through Noah, through Shem, and through Abram, redemption will come. But Sarah is barren. That is a threat to redemption. And that's where Moses leaves us in Genesis 11. She is barren. So as we reflect on Genesis 11, brothers and sisters, we learn about a people who think that they can control God. That if we just build a really tall uh, tower, then we can get to God whenever we want. And God can come down whenever he wants. That is a very low view of God. That's a very high view of man. And what does God say? The pathway of you trying to get to God on your own ability will always result in curses. What will happen? But what we're going to learn about next week and in the weeks to come is that divine blessings can be experienced by us. Not when we ascend to God, but when God descends to us. He does this with Abraham, and he does this finally and ultimately when Jesus Christ was born. Here we have God himself dwelling amongst us as Emmanuel, God with us. 
who lives the life that we were called to live, and he dies the death we deserve. So that if you trust in Jesus on God's terms, you could be right with God on God's terms, not your terms. You could have divine blessings. So brothers and sisters, the application is very clear. Whose kingdom are you in? Are you in God's kingdom? Mourning over your sin, but rejoicing that your sin is not the last answer? Are you rejoicing that God has defeated your sin? And on His terms, you're right with the God of this universe. And on His terms, you experience divine blessings. Are you in that kingdom? Are you in the kingdom of the serpent? That thinks, oh, you can, you can be blessed by God. Just work hard. Just go to church. And then you'll be blessed. Oh, just give the church money and then you'll be blessed. Oh, just be a good person and then you'll be blessed. That may all sound good, but that is the slither of the snake. The snake whispers in our ear that, hey, you could be right with God. Just work hard and then you'll gain salvation. The Tower of Babel says absolutely not. Human ingenuity, our efforts to gain our own salvation will always result in cursing. But praise God that God has done something. So whose kingdom are you in? I invite anybody who's in the kingdom of the serpent to come today into the kingdom of God. To trust that Jesus is who he says he is. He's not just a carpenter. He's your savior. So that if you would trust in him today, you would have life. And if you are in God's kingdom, brothers and sisters, let's take sin serious, but let's take grace even more serious. Let's run from sin because it's awful, and let's run to God because he is gracious to us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word that is powerful and speaks to us a message a glorious message of redemption. I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would take sin serious. That they would not minimize sin, but let sin and its grossness and awfulness be a context where they love and savor your glory. I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would mature in the faith that they would be loving your glory more today because of Genesis 11. And I pray for my lost friends that they would come to know you today. That they would forsake their own attempts to be made right with you. And they would trust that you have done it. That you have sent Jesus to die their death. I pray today they would trust in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.